My name is Julian Goh, and I'm moderating this session. This is the third session of the Reimagining Reinventing Police Conference. Um, I'm delighted that you could join us this afternoon. Uh, if you haven't seen our earlier sessions, welcome to uh, what will be your first session. And just a reminder, uh, we will have another session later today, and then tomorrow we have a full lineup as well. So I hope to see some of you there. This session is titled From the Ground Up and Top Down. Um, to tell you the truth, it doesn't mean that much. Uh, so I hope the panelists don't feel obliged to address that. It's really just a cover all to, uh, to get at some of the different ways in which we can think about um, police reform and, and, and knowledge about policing. Um, we have three presentations today. Um, and we will go in alphabetical order. I'll introduce each presenter. They will speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then I'll introduce the next one and they will speak. And after the three, we will um, open it up for Q&A. Um, if you do want to uh, put in a question um, while the session is going on, you can just use the Q&A um, option on the Zoom. So first of all, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Michelle Phelps. Uh, Michelle Phelps is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, her research is in the sociology of punishment, focusing in particular on the punitive turn in the United States. Uh, she has published her work in a number of journals and books, one of which is with Philip Goodman and Joshua Page, titled Breaking the Pendulum, The Long Struggle Over Criminal Justice. And this book traces the history of US criminal justice reforms from the birth of the penitentiary to contemporary struggles to end mass incarceration. Professor Phelps also has a history of working with various nonprofit organizations such as the Prison University Project at St. Quentin State University uh, State Prison and the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, among others. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Phelps, for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Terrific, thank you very much. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you Julian for the invitation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so folks can see my slides. So thank you very much everyone for being here. So I've spent the past four years studying community perceptions of policing and the process of police reform and contestation over um, reform versus transformation versus abolition in the context of uh, the Minneapolis Police Department. And today I wanna share a couple of key findings from this study, um, which I think help us to understand some of the roots of the Minneapolis uprising and also the struggle for reimagining, transforming or abolishing and defunding the police that we've seen in the past two months. So this project, the, the broader project, had a couple of different components. The first one, and the one I'll be talking about today, uh, is that together with a team of students who you can see pictured on the slide here, we completed 112 interviews with North Minneapolis residents. Um, North Minneapolis is a collection of neighborhoods in Minneapolis north of downtown, marked by high rates of poverty, racial segregation, gun violence, and aggressive police contact. And the interviews asked people to talk about their experiences with police, but also their understanding of police activism, anti-violence, anti-police violence activism, um, and police reform, and their own desires for the future of policing. And we recruited a, um, a racially diverse sample of Northsiders, drawing both from residents of color who largely identified as Black or African American, and white residents who were about 20% of our sample. Um, and I'll talk a lot today about the differences between those two groups of residents. Um, we also did a, a number of other data collection efforts that you can see listed here on the screen, including interviews with activists and professionals involved in police reform or transformation or abolition, observations of policing events and vigils and forums, and then tracing what reforms MPD was enacting during this period. I'd be happy to talk about any of that um, in the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, in the Q&A. Um, so during the process in which we were collecting data, as many people now know, the MPD was undergoing an intense period of 
police reform, but also a continued wave of scandals and protests. So in 2015, in response to the first wave of Black Lives Matter protests around police violence, President Obama commissioned a task force on 21st century policing, which we've heard made reference of today. That, that task force produced a report that is sort of a summary statement on the sort of vision for progressive or liberal police reform um, and included a lot about police professionalization, police training, and police accountability reforms, all uh, designed explicitly to foster community trust and police legitimacy. And in response, police departments across the country, and particularly in urban jurisdictions and um, democratic-leaning urban jurisdictions, began to adopt the reforms based on that model. So Minneapolis emerged as one of the leaders in this 21st century style policing reform. Uh, we served as one of the six national demonstration sites for the initiative, National Initiatives on Trust and Reconciliation, which started in 2015, which was meant to be the sort of post-task force um, kind of best practices of police reform. These reforms included community listening sessions, restricting use of force policies, public release of data on police stops and police use of force, stricter body camera policies, procedural justice training, implicit bias training, developing a mental health co-responder pilot, and strengthen misconduct review process. But during that same period of reform, Minneapolis was rocked by a series of policing scandals, perhaps most notably to a national audience, the 2015 police shooting of Jamar Clark, a black man in North Minneapolis, uh, which led to uh, a three week occupation by the local Black Lives Matter group of the police precinct in North. So it was during this period of intense contestation around policing and police reform that we wanted to talk to residents in the most impacted and most heavily policed communities to see how they were making sense of both police violence, but also of police reform and the limits of police reform. So to walk through some of the findings, first of all, as will surprise, I, I assume nobody in this audience, um, overall measures of trust in the police in our sample were quite low. We started our interviews with a um, survey of standardized procedural justice and um, legal cynicism measures. Most of the people in our sample said that police only occasionally or sometimes tried to do what was best or explained their decisions or respected people's rights or made fair and neutral decisions. And most of our sample agreed or strongly agreed that police officers judged people based on their race or ethnicity. And we found uh, an increasing racial convergence in white residents and residents of color who again were largely but not exclusively identified as black or African American in understanding the problem of racialized police violence, but the path through which people took to understand that racialized police violence looked really different. So for white residents, that knowledge was often driven by high profile cases of police violence and Black Lives Matter protests and media coverage, where it is in contrast for residents of color and particularly black residents, these negative attitudes about the police often came from personal experiences of police targeting, verbal and physical abuse and police neglect or failure to care either for themselves or their loved ones and people in their in their social networks. So um, for black residents, this was a, a sense of finally the country is paying attention to what we had long known that police pose a legal threat, whereas for white residents, it was more of a new awakening uh, about coming to, to grapple with the reality of racialized police violence. Okay, so the majority of our samples saw deep problems in policing, but how did they think about redressing these problems? What were their perspectives on police reform? Many of the people we talked to had um, really different ideas about how to move forward. There wasn't a, a sort of clear consensus voice. People had lots of different specific proposals um, that were sort of more or less important to them. But I would say it was broadly true that most of the folks that we talked to who saw racialized police violence as a problem endorsed the kinds of reforms articulated in the 21st century policing report, including body cams and, and tighter body cam policies, procedural justice, racial, racial bias, and de-escalation training and hiring officers from underrepresented and local communities. They also wanted to see more accountability for officers accused of misconduct and police violence in terms of the internal discipline and firing process, but also in terms of criminal charges and more accountability in that process. I'm sorry, more transparency in that process of accountability. 
But yet here too, we saw racial divides in how residents were making sense about police reforms. So for black residents, their embodied experiences of racism, both inside and outside of policing, often led them to conclude that the core of the problem was racism, which manifested both in police violence, but also other forms of racial harm, including exposure to uh, criminal violence or interpersonal violence in addition to police violence. And this focus on entrenched and persistent racism pushed black respondents to question the effectiveness of police reform and to push for more radical alternatives. So here's a series of quotes from a man um, that we titled Teddy in the paper. Teddy was, oops, excuse me. Uh, Teddy was a, a man of color in his mid thirties who described his deep fear of the police. So very early on in the interview, Teddy told the interviewer, I don't feel safe with the police period because I've been targeted too much by the police jumping out on me, violating my rights, putting my life in danger. Well, they point guns at me and for no apparent reason. And this kind of experience was really common among particularly the black men that we talked to, that many of them had had officers draw their guns on them for um, what seemed to them no discernible reason. Um, and then he starts to talk about um, the killing of somebody, a black man in the South. I think he was talking about the death of Terrence Crutcher by Betty Shelby, but I'm not positive. And he says, you know, police officer down South killed a man on camera. I mean, the man's got his hands up and everything. He's not resisting and everything. I mean, in front of the whole world, she kills him and she didn't serve no time, didn't get convicted. You know what I mean? This is ridiculous. I mean, you're getting away with murder on camera. So why even record it? Why even have it on camera? Why even say, bring a body cam, a dash cam, anything? What use is it? And so Teddy would tell us how every time that there was a high profile case of police violence, he would say to himself, ah, here we go again. They're trying to cover it up and right the wrong. They don't want to hold officers accountable because it's somebody he killed, you know, that doesn't matter. He's black, whatever. That life don't matter. You know, it's just a joke because it's like the same old, same old. And so we would see this kind of rhetoric in um, a lot of the residents of color and particularly black residents discourses where they would say on, in one breath, yes, like I think we should be recruiting more officers from the community. I think we need to do de-escalation training. I need to we need to change our policies, but I'm not sure any of it is actually going to matter, right? Because what has any of this reform actually done for us? What are the tangible results? So Rudy, um, a, a black woman in her 50s, gave an even uh, clear example of this. And she said to us, we're still, oops, sorry, folks, I'm trying to move the, the little Zoom icon to see the quote. Um, uh, Rudy says, we're still dying quicker than we can affect change. I don't want to be dead before I experience a neighborhood where I feel safe when the police are around. So obviously we saw that there was this, this stark racial divide and sort of how serious the problem was perceived and, and how willing residents were to think that police reform um, was going to make a, a tangible difference. But this focus for some residents of color on racism as the key issue rather than policing per se meant that some of the folks that we talked to wanted not... Um, uh, not just to change how we approach policing, but also to change broader structures in society. And for some of those folks, they saw responsive and just and accountable policing as part of the solution. So Teddy, for example, who we just heard from, um, when asked about what he'd like to see in reform, he said, we should clean it all out, all the crooks, all the racists, from the chief on down to the patrol. But he then went on to say that they should rebuild a police force that would really protect the community. So these kinds of debates about whether the problem is policing or whether the problem is racism, which manifests in policing and outside of policing, I think are all coming to a forefront right now as Minneapolis grapples with the future of policing in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd. So many of the themes from our findings around the, the sort of limit of white solidarity around the problem of police violence and, and preference for traditional reform rather than transformational or abolitionist approach, and some of the black pushback that says that the problem is policing, or I'm sorry, racism, both inside and outside of policing, um, rather than policing per se, we can see in the debates. So in um, last, last month, a uh, majority of the, the Minneapolis City Council, who you can see um, here on the stage in this image, they declared an intention to quote, dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. 
Um, but details of what dismantling means in the, the wake of that press conference have really varied depending on which city council member is talking from a more abolition vision to a more sort of Newark style model for those that are familiar with that example of disbanding but then reconstituting a, a reformed and um, different police force um, but out of the same kind of cloth. Pushed to action by local abolitionist groups, in July, the city council voted to support an amendment proposition that would go on to the November ballot, um, where residents could vote about whether they wanted to replace the MPD um, with a Department of Public Safety. Um, echoing many of the white North Siders in our study, many white elites are fighting against the city charter amendment, including our mayor, certain business interests, um, quieter members of the city council member or the city council, but there's a couple of holdouts, and then folks on the city charter commission, which are reviewing the charter amendment proposal, um, all argue that the police violent, the problem of police violence is best solved through police reform rather than defunding. Perhaps more surprisingly, many of the blacks of the city's black civil rights um, groups and community leaders have come out fighting against the amendment proposal as well, arguing that the rush process has escalated gun violence in Northside, unfairly maligned the reform oriented chief, uh, Chief Arredondo, who's the first black police chief in Minneapolis, um, and focused uh, attention on the wrong piece of this puzzle. So just to wrap up, because I know I'm out of time, um, from my perspective, I think both city council members working to dismantle the MPD and the community leaders speaking out in North Minneapolis are correct. So policing has never worked in Minneapolis to protect black residents in Northside or elsewhere. And the city will need to do more than just reimagine policing to address the city's stark inequalities. Police violence is ultimately just one manifestation of race class subjugation and one manifestation of many social determinants that shorten the lives of black Americans. And all of the policing proposals being advanced from the most minor procedural tweaks to the most major reforms may reduce the frequency and violence of police contact but even police defunding, even with major shifts towards, say, alternative first responder models, um, that alone will not redress what Monica Bell calls legal estrangement from the state. And in done, in, done in a haphazard way that doesn't address communities' real need could, in fact, make it worse. And so we argue uh, in the work that's coming out of these interviews um, that to really answer the call to make Black Lives Matter, we need to address the many roots and branches of structural racism, including policing, but also other holistic approaches that give real safety, equity, and power to communities of color. So I will pause there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Phelps. Um, our next speaker is Wesley Skogan, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science, Legal Studies, and the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University. Um, he's had a long and distinguished career teaching, researching, and writing about policing and related issues. Um, he has far too many publications to mention here, but I'll just note that his more recent books include Police and Community in Chicago and Community Policing Can It Work? I'll now turn it over to Professor Skogan. Thanks to Julian and everybody who, um, and Joe and everybody who's been involved in making this happen. It's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, the theme of our little panel this afternoon uh, has the words ground up and top down um, because it's a discussion of uh, both the roots of and the obstacles to, to change. There's certainly been a lot of, a lot happening at the bottom uh, when it comes to demands for police change. Our, 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 our newspapers and television sets are filled with news of that. But I'm in a political science department. So when I think about these things, I have that hat on. Uh, and it leads me naturally to also worry about top-down issues, to focus on some of those instead uh, as well. In political science, one of the most common metaphors, just two words that we throw out and everybody knows what it means, uh, is city limits. City limits is the title of a foundational book written by, by Paul Peterson. Uh, and in it, he reviews the, the, the limits to the ability of cities and the American scheme of government to accomplish things. Now, Peterson's book focuses principally on economic issues, uh, in particular, taxing and spending and supporting of city, city social policies. Uh, 
but and at the end, the city limits, of course, there are extremely, extremely fundamental. Uh, as I follow the debates on, on, on changes in American policing, I'll use a more generic word than reform. Um, uh, it seems to me that the discussion of, of the city limits idea has really been under considered in discussions of changing in policing because when it comes to city law enforcement, uh, there's lots of city limits that apply. And politically, one of the most fundamental is the one that's hardly ever discussed, which is the important role played by the American state legislatures. Uh, in truth, much of what happens about policing is not decided in city halls. It's decided in the state, state capitals. Uh, the room where it happens is often in the state capital uh, and not in uh, city hall. Uh, so given the importance of, of the states uh, in, 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 in structuring and controlling policing, uh, of course, the key feature of American states today is the phenomenon of red states, blue cities. Uh, and that has to do with a relatively small number of extremely populous places in this country who tend to vote in a progressive fashion. And the very large number of, of, of less populated places, uh, which are politically very powerful, uh, uh, who have other views. Uh, Hillary Clinton may have won 88 of the 100 most populous counties in the country. Uh, but Republicans control 60% of all the state legislatures. Um, half, of all state legi half of all states, they control both houses of the legislature plus the governorship, their complete uh, party control. And this Republican fraction has been growing over time. This has been an increasing trend, not a, not a decreasing trend. So we have this combination of a very large role of state government through its laws uh, in controlling what can happen to police departments plus the red states, blue states problem. And certainly you see this in, to follow up on Michelle's comments in, in Minneapolis, uh, which enjoys a state government which has divided party control and the Republican parts of the legislature not particularly interested in, in, in police reform. Now, this is not an American government lecture, although I, I give American government lectures, um, but the principle is what I'm gonna call state preemption. In law, state law trumps local ordinances. Legally, cities are creatures of the state. They are created by the states. The rules of incorporation are set down to them. Cities are, in fact, corporations uh, ruled by state city corporate law. Uh, the, for example, the, the, the city attorney for the city of Chicago is called the Corporation Council, and that's because the city of Chicago is a corporation. Uh, and we've seen this, this preemptive role happening all over the place. Uh, outside of the policing domain, for example, when's the last time you heard of a state governor uh, who's ordered states to, to reopen their businesses, uh, who has uh, vetoed attempts of cities to impose masking requirements on their own citizens? Uh, they're, they're doing this in, through pre the preemptive powers uh, of the state. Uh, er earlier, governors and legislatures in many states have clobbered the cities that tried to declare themselves sanctuary cities uh, in response to immigration concerns. Uh, uh, the, 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 the cities vetoed their city ordinances uh, and took away their discretionary state money until they were, they were really feeling the pinch. Uh, in the state of Texas, cities cannot tax plastic bags because the state legislature says cities can't tax plastic bags. Uh, so legislatures and governors can beat cities into submission uh, in the American system of government. Now, it doesn't happen everywhere. 50 states, there's lots of different things happen uh, in different places. Of the 40 American states, of the 50 American states, 40 of them are what are called Dillon's rule states. Dillon's rule states are ones that exercise the preemptive powers. So in 40 of 50, we get, we, we get patterns of state preemption taking place uh, on a fairly routine basis. Uh, here in, in Illinois, here in Chicago, where I'm sitting right now, Illinois is quite free of this. How, Illinois, in fact, is the most home rule state in the country. Uh, both in terms of constitutions and statutes. Uh, Illinois cities have enormous flexibility in what they, what they do. And I, I'm gonna tell you that's not always a good idea. Sometimes we pine for state leadership uh, as well. So as I, I then, <clears throat> with this in mind, I look at the inventory <clears throat> of concerns that are being raised about policing, the proposals for reform, the proposals for change. Uh, what I see is that lots of them intercept with state laws uh, in ways that in at least 40 to 50 states uh, can, can, can lead to problems. This morning, uh, Philip McHarris talked about the importance of figuring out the obstacles through which police, people interested in changing policing have to navigate. Uh, and I'm gonna give you some obstacles. So essentially, I'm gonna list out some of the limits to reform. 
as a police strategy. First of all, let me just give you a quick list of the things that have been talked about in terms of changes in policing that I also are significantly overlap the powers and, and authority of the states. Um, and then after running through that quick list, I'll go back to three of them just to sort of show you how it works. Uh, and then I've got a wrap up at the end. But later on, if you want to talk about any of the other proposals for reform, we can talk about more about what the what the what the legal standing and independence of cities to make decisions about them really is. So here's the here's the here's the hit list of things that are subject to Dillon's rule. Um, arbitration of the disciplinary decisions by police chiefs and police boards, the allowable scope and the legal status of union contracts, including what can be bargained, police residency requirements, qualified immunity from personal lawsuits by police officers, the civil service job tenure of police chiefs, the certification standards for officers, the decertification standards for officers, which are different, state mandated officer training, chokehold as a use of force, uh, investigating and disciplining police officers, the transparency and public access to officer records and disciplinary records, rules for body-worn cameras, sentencing enhancements for any aggression against police officers. These are called Blue Lives Matter statutes, and every state in the union has a Blue Lives Matter measure that gives extra penalties if you do something bad with a police officer. Uh, and finally, data collection, which documents what happens during traffic stops uh, and stop and frisk. Now, the 50 states vary a lot. Some have gone one direction on some of the things, or many of the things in this list. Other states have gone the other direction. Don't think this is a, a one-way street when we're talking about changing uh, in policing. So let's go back and, and take a look at three of these. First of all, I want to start with the one that drives police chiefs crazy. I've talked to a lot of chief, police chiefs in my days. Uh, and this is the one that simply drives them up a tree, and that's arbitration. Arbitration falls under the rights of police as public sector workers. Ah, keep an eye on that little part of the phrase. Uh, it's often, the rights of arbitration rights are often in the statutes for state civil servants. Uh, these are labor protections which have been put in place because of the pressure of organized labor. So for example, when we talk about the strong arbitration rights of police officers in Illinois, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, uh, that's because they're part of the Uniform Arbitration Act, which is a state law that protects all public sector workers. This was hard won by the, by the, by the labor movement. Uh, Illinois is a pro-labor state. Uh, touching the Uniform Arbitration Act and some others I'll mention to you uh, can be a no-no. Uh, in addition, of course, police officers often have added a few extra protections for themselves, typically in the union contracts. But the states, through their labor protection acts, play an important role here. So the way this works in the police department is investigation, the results of investigations filter up through police departments after something maybe bad has happened. There's many veto points along the way. All along the way, there's a dozen different ways that it can be stymied, transferred into something else or made to disappear, uh, supervisory and managerial review. Finally, then it gets up to the chief uh, who reluctantly, I'll tell you reluctantly, decides on the punishment or decides on discharge. And I say reluctantly because the, the chief is going to play an pay an internal political cost you know, for making a hard decision at that stage. But if the chief does, the next thing that happens is officers file a grievance, you know, contesting the decision and calling for arbitration. This is their right by law. Um, and the in, in, in law, arbitration decisions are binding and final. You cannot have them appeal to the courts. You can't appeal them. Uh, the, the decision of the arbitrator is final. So there's been research on arbitration. My colleague at Northwestern, Mark Iris, uh, has, been, has been one of those. And here's what you'll find. It's 50-50. Uh, in Chicago, for example, over a long period of time, the arbitrator finds for the officer 50% of the time, and he finds for the department 50% of the time. In Houston, ah, the split is 53-47, OK? The department wins a little more often than Houston. Uh, his look at Minneapolis says it's 50-50 uh, in Minneapolis, which seems to be the rule of thumb. And the reason for that is how arbitrators are selected. Arbitrators are selected in law, by the way, uh, uh, to be fair. And what does fairness mean? What fairness means is both management and labor get the ex arbitrators off the list, and they must agree on the arbitrators. And for an arbitrator to be selected, they must be fair, which means that they find for both sides. If they don't find for both sides, they're not fair, uh, and one of, the, one of the sides will, will X them out. Uh, so the, the, the process ends up with 50-50 splits being the natural result of arbitration. And as a result, the chief, after having made these, these politically costly and, and personally, ter sometimes personally terrible decisions, 
finds them back on the street half the time. Chiefs are accountable for their organization, but they can't even control who works for them. Uh, and it drives them completely crazy. Um, a second very different example would be having to do with ac public access to records and transparency of, of records for police officer disciplinary records, uh, records about uh, investigations. Uh, first of all, there are statutes in every state regarding public and media access to record, records on complaints and investigations. Um, Hawaii, for example, just before last, last month, in Hawaii, police officers had special secrecy to theirs. They're like quite more, quite different from other state workers. Hawaii, in a liberal move, made police officer records as accessible as any other uh, public employees. In Illinois, we just finished a terrible records retention fight uh, where, 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 the, where the, the, the police contract re required the disciplinary records be destroyed after five years. Uh, it's Illinois state law that when there's a conflict between a union contract and a state labor law, that the union contract always prevails over state labor law. We are a, we are a labor friendly state. Uh, the state Supreme Court in an amazing decision overruled that statute by saying the public policy demand for access overruled the state law that says the union contracts are primary. This is the first time this has ever happened in Illinois history. We don't know if we're gonna see it again. You can also see the transparency issues having to do with body-worn cameras. This supposedly is the great technology fix that's going to help uh, bring officer misconduct to light and shine the light on what happens uh, on the street. Uh, but it's state laws that determine what can be released uh, and what cannot, and what must be redacted before it can be released. Uh, so, for example, recently North Carolina simply passed a law making it making all all body camera video part of their officers' personnel files. By simply making it part of their personnel files, they're not subject to FOIA. The public and the media cannot get interested. In fact, they're almost impossible for anyone to access. In 2017, Pennsylvania took police audio and video records out of the, out of the list of public, they had a list of public records. They took the police ones out uh, and said, oh, it's up to police departments to decide uh, what to release. Uh, there's a long list of states that have exempted body board camera uh, footage from, from uh, state open records laws. In addition, the state legislatures have imposed lots of exceptions to access. So even when you do have access, if it's in a home, if it's in a school, if it's in a hospital, if it's in a mental health facility, or if it's in one of those uh, ongoing investigations, which seems to un ungo forever, uh, uh, those are often also in, the, in, in addition uh, exempted from release. So the transparency of records is an issue that sits largely in state capital buildings. Uh, my, my third and last example would be collective bargaining rights. Uh, here the leading scholar is Stephen, Stephen Ruchin, who's at Loyola University Law School uh, here in Chicago, who's done a mammoth study of uh, police union contracts. Um, and you know, what, what state, what, 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 what municipalities and unions can bargain over is set, the parameters for that are set by state law. Uh, and what's happened over time is that there's been mission creep with the bargaining going far beyond wages and benefits to cover a vast host of, 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 right, of rights for individual police officers and, and rights for police unions. Limits on interrogations of officers after alleged misconduct, mandating the destruction of disciplinary records, uh, can't be forced to testify to any civilian body. Uh, the city will indemnify officers in case they're found uh, personally liable in a civil suit. So while officers currently have qualified immunity from personal liability, uh, what they actually have is absolute immunity because the city will pay their part if they're found, if they're found uh, guilty in some kind of compensatory damages. Uh, limits on the length of internal investigations, waiting periods before internal affairs can ask questions, the right to strike, residency requirements, uh, the ability to appeal to arbitrators, uh, all these can be also put into of the collective bargaining retirements. Uh, as I said before in Illinois, which is, which is a labor state, all this happens under state law. Uh, the Illinois Public Labor Relations Act is one of those in addition to the, in addition to the State Uniform Arbitration Act, uh, which again favors collective bargaining, favors labor agreements over state law, and favors arbitrary arbitration awards. Uh, so why does this happen? Why does this happen just in those three example areas, but across a long range of of police related issues, which I, I read only a partial list of. Uh, one obviously is the political cloud of police unions, uh, whose endorsements, uh, whose money, and the appearance of prominent members of the, of the union and the police department 
uh, can be useful for, for politicians. Um, it takes place in a, in, you know, a largely law and order political environment. Most of the time, almost everybody thinks crime is going up. Um, uh, and, and the claim is that hemming in the police by putting in these excessive uh, restrictions on, on their ability to, uh, to arrest bad guys uh, is putting the public at risk. But another very important reason is because many of these things don't cost any money. Uh, so the late state legislature went under pressure to do something uh, or were wanting, were wanting to be symbolic, symbolically important, uh, uh, responsive to, to police unions, could pick things that are not in the budget. And these are almost always having to do with rights uh, uh, and access because of how they, they can give them to police unions, they don't have to put them on the, on the, on the budget. And that's always a very attractive uh, political thing. And behind that, the most fundamental thing going on, of course, is cities have agreed to these union contracts. We have them because cities have agreed. Mayors and bargaining experts have negotiated them. City councils have approved them. Um, and so we have them through fair and open democratic processes. Cities also do this because they don't have to give money. It seemingly doesn't cost anything. Uh, but they also do this because they've got a, a, a list of things they're bargaining for. And labor contracts are bargaining contracts. They have to give things up uh, to get other things. I've watched Chicago approach the police union and its bargaining for decades and decades. They seem to me that the city of Chicago has two core elements of control that they're simply unwilling to give up. One is Chicago residency, which is only in the state of city of Chicago, in the whole state of Illinois, is there a residency requirement. And the other is the right to strike. Now, you don't know if this is, this is a, a labor state. Public, public, public employees have a right to strike. Um, Illinois, the city of Chicago sees, the, sees a, a, a no-strike clause as being, as being existential for the city. And so they will give up anything to keep the right to strike clause in the union contract. There's now not been a union contract for three years. Uh, it's been moving toward arbitration. Uh, the, the, the head of the police union has said residency and the right to strike are his number one goals in the upcoming negotiation. But of course, he's not going to give up anything already he has because rights always ratchet up over time. So to summarize, what we've got is red states and blue states, at least half of the states solidly conservative in their governance. Uh, but don't underestimate the police friendliness in, in, in the blue states, uh, in, in, in democratic states. They have plenty of state friends downstate in the legislature as well. Here in Illinois, downstate begins at 169th Street and goes all the way to the Mason-Dixon line. So downstate is a very large a piece of territory. There's plenty of police-friendly Democrats uh, in the state, Illinois state legislature. And then again, I want to remind you that many of these police labor rights are part of a large, larger package of public sector labor rights, which were hard won. They were won by organized labor. They're the rights of all workers. They're in or, these organized labor statutes. Uh, and organized labor is going to be very hesitant about getting involved in messing with the protections that they've been able to achieve for all uh, public sector workers uh, through years of struggle. Uh, that's it. And thanks a lot. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Skogan. Um, last but not least, uh, our, our speaker is Forrest Stewart. Forrest is an associate professor of sociology at Stanford University and director of the Stanford Ethnography Lab after first spending the early years of his career here at the University of Chicago. Uh, he does ethnographic research on policing and communities and has published various important scholarly works um, such as his book, Down, Out and Under Arrest, Policing and Everyday Life in Skid Row, which is an in-depth ethnography of Los Angeles Skid Row district. Um, he also has written uh, long form essays for mass media outlets, such as Mother Jones, Wired, and Chicago Magazine, among other outlets. Um, so Forrest, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so, so, so thank you, Julian. Thank you to, to the organizers of this conference. It's a real honor and, and privilege to be able to be a part of this conversation with some of the folks that um, I respect the most and whose work I, I draw on and look to for for a lot of ideas and inspiration. And it's, it's especially great to be on this panel with um, Michelle and Wes to, to think about how ground up and top down um, approaches and reforms and transformations might work. And I've, I've been trying, I've spent the morning trying to figure out where exactly Julian and the organizers located me on the spectrum. Um, and so today 
I'm, I'm guessing I'm, I'm going to be talking about some ideas and programs that perhaps exist somewhere in the middle of this top down and, and, and bottom up spectrum or dichotomy or however we want to think about it. So um, coming out of my field work that I did for um, my book on skid row policing, I've been really vocal in my criticisms of conventional and popular police reforms. So police reforms that I'm sure we're all familiar with, things like mental health training for officers or de-escalation training for officers, or even this big, broad, massive uh, community policing um, initiative that, that, that has swept the country and become kind of the most popular way that we do policing nowadays and becomes kind of this panacea for, for solving all of these problems. But I, I think like the, the vast majority of researchers and academics, I've gotten, I would like to think that I've gotten pretty good at diagnosing the problem, at, at highlighting, documenting, quantifying the harms caused by police. Um, I think I, like others, have gotten pretty good at saying what the wrong course of action is. And I think up until recently, it was hard enough just convincing audiences um, to take these kinds of critical diagnoses seriously. But now we've witnessed this incredible change over the last few months. Support for decreasing and reorienting and defunding and abolishing the police has reached historic levels. We've seen tens of millions of people around the globe taking to the streets and demanding change. And so I think, um, and I wanna encourage us as academics and as researchers to perhaps think about what it would mean to go beyond what I see as a kind of increasingly well-worn diagnosis and critique of policing to see if we can maybe perhaps use the skills and tools and expertise that we have to think about research-backed, evidence-based ways to move forward, right? So, so um, what I'm increasingly asking in my own work is what are the concrete next steps we might take to realize the kinds of demands that are being made um, increasingly loudly uh, in the streets. So let me see if I can, yeah, I can advance this slide. So, so coincidentally, um, throughout all of this, over the last six months or so, I've been working with Catherine Beckett and Monica Bell to analyze what we think is this really innovative program called LEAD that started in Seattle and has been expanding uh, across the country. And the program was originally developed by the Seattle Public Defender Association uh, in collaboration with community organizations and some city agencies to explicitly rechannel vulnerable populations, specifically people contending with behavioral health issues away from arrest, away from jail, and into services based very squarely on the pillars of harm reduction. And uh, for anyone on this, on this webinar, on this call, who isn't familiar with harm reduction, just, just very briefly, we're talking about a public health philosophy that sees things like substance abuse and homelessness, um, things like this as symptoms of structural failings, right? It's harm reduction prides itself on being non-coercive, meaning that it doesn't require abstinence or sobriety to receive services. It sees behavioral change as long-term. It doesn't impose arbitrary time limits. If you've heard of things like housing first or needle exchanges or methadone treatments, these are kind of quintessential examples of harm reduction. And in this work that I've been doing alongside Catherine and on, alongside Monica, um, taking a look at LEAD, I've been increasingly convinced that LEAD, this kind of program, presents a potential model for using local policy initiatives and programs to actually begin generating the kind of systematic transformations in policing that are increasingly on the radar, um, that are increasingly on the lips of folks calling for real change. Transformations that don't just make officers nicer, they don't just make officers more empathetic, but in fact, remove officers from the very fundamental task of community health um, and safety. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna enter into this knowing that like, right now, any mention of ground level concrete programs like LEAD um, in a lot of circles generate hisses and boos just from the outset. Um, and so, so I think it's important for me, I want to, to spend the rest of my time really unpacking why I see the kind of potential that I see um, in a program like LEAD. And in fact, I think if someone asked me to pick one initiative or intervention going on right now that I think would generate the most immediate and biggest reduction in the harms that policing causes the most amount of people, and the program that does so while systematically removing officers from the task of community health and safety, I think right now I would choose some either LEAD or, or, or something very similar to it. And so I, I just want to point out, I think uh, LEAD's impact and potential can be linked to these three characteristics or principles of the program. Um, 
pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but I think that they have um, a whole lot of impact. So first, uh, this is a program that makes police involvement in addressing behavioral health issues a key site of intervention. Second, it makes civilian complaints, specifically calls to 911 and 311, a key moment of intervention. And then third, these interventions are guided by this underlying principle that any future reform or policy should, could be evaluated according to its capacity to reduce police ability. So what is reducing police ability? By that I mean, it should be judged according to its capacity to meaningfully diminish society's reliance on police to resolve social problems. So, so why, why focus on behavioral health? Um, it's, it, that's that first point. I, I wanna go into detail on each of these and, and behavioral health is a, is a really important one. Um, so when we look at the numbers, it becomes readily apparent that police contact is arguably most frequent and also most harmful when it comes to people contending with behavioral health issues. So we can look at estimates, recent estimates. Nearly half of everyone killed by police uh, are people experiencing disabilities. One in four people killed by police experience mental health disorders. As much as 20% of all police encounters involve people experiencing mental health disorders. Drug possession, according to the ACLU, is the single most arrested crime in the United States, occurring every 25 seconds and disproportionately bringing black folks into the criminal legal system. According to BJS, um, an estimated quarter of jail and prison inmates committed their offense to obtain money for drugs and roughly 44% of jail inmates um, are reported to be experiencing mental health disorders, right? So, so kind of long story short of these statistics, an overwhelming amount of policing and an overwhelming amount of the criminal legal system more generally is aimed very squarely at behavioral health. So I, so I think it's, it's no mystery that some of the most popular well-funded reforms as, as, as um, Alex called them you know, in the first session, ultimately procedural reforms have tried to target this exact issue of behavioral health. Um, but it turns out, um, and I think maybe they target this precisely because it turns out the police don't do very well handling behavioral health issues. So, you know, over the last couple of decades, we've seen this explosion in all kinds of stuff. So we've got, uh, you know, new mental health training for officers. Just about 100% of departments have some kind of usually very small online training module where officers are learning about everything from dementia to um, uh, alcoholism, right? We've also seen um, kind of more intensive training that I think is becoming even more popular. You may have heard of CIT, the Memphis model. This is a, a more intensive form of training and kind of reallocating those expert officers to handle uh, mental health crises. We've also seen this rapid expansion. It's something that I talk about quite a bit uh, in my first book, um, this expansion of pre-booking diversion programs. And these were designed to allow officers to arrest people and then use that arrest as a kind of intake into mental health services and substance abuse programs rather than sending them to jail. But I mean, I think this is no surprise for most of the folks on this, on this uh, call that despite the popularity of these things, we haven't seen very promising results. The formal evaluations that are out there are still largely inconclusive as to whether or not there's any measurable decrease in injury and mortality at the hands of officers. But I think even more troubling, uh, observational research like mine has shown, I think really counterintuitively, that many of these programs, including pre-booking diversion programs, often increase officer aggression and officer punitiveness. And the reason that they do this is that they allow officers to see those punitive violent interactions that they engage in, things like arrest or citations or move along orders or confiscating property, essentially as somehow compassionate forms of social service and care, right? So it, it reframes in the minds of officers what the meaning of that arrest is. That, that arrest is now helping someone because it's, it's opening up a pathway, it's opening up an intake into social services. So we've tied punitive measures to the kinds of social services that vulnerable populations need so much. But I think even more so, um, beyond those lackluster results, beyond those counterintuitive ways that they increase punitiveness, I think there's an even more important and common shortcoming among these reforms, and that's that they do nothing to alter the police ability of behavioral health. Right? So, so sure, they're ostensibly designed to help officers police more compassionately, to police better, but in doing so, what are they doing? They're actually serving to expand officer involvement and responsibility in behavioral health, 
right? They're expanding and reinforcing this broader societal notion that uh, we need to rely on police first and foremost as those responders to, to calls, to, to issues, to social problems. So then this, this raises the question, what would it look like to reduce the policeability of behavioral issues? Um, what would a program look like that did so? What would need to be done? And um, this, is a, this is a question that you know, the folks who designed LEAD and, and who have kind of evolved it over the last few years directly recognized. Um, and it's this need to go further upstream in the, in the broader policing process, that rather than thinking about officer contact as the moment of intervention, or thinking about um, arrest as the moment of intervention, or thinking about the court process as the moment of intervention to decrease harms, to reduce policeability. If we're serious about reducing policeability, we need to go to the moment when officers are initially summoned to resolve these issues in the first place, right? Very simply, I'm talking about calls to 911, calls to 311. This is the key moment when civilians decide whether or not police are the appropriate agency to resolve an issue. This is the moment in which the police are rendered the most appropriate first responders to something like behavioral health. And so thinking about it this way, thinking about calls to 911, the summoning of police as a key moment of intervention, is in sharp contrast to the kinds of reforms that I mentioned, right? which don't intervene, as you can see on this timeline, which don't intervene until, until much later. So how do we do this? Um, well, that moment of intervention is where I believe that LEAD is doing some, some really meaningful work that, that opens up at least my eyes in terms of, of, of rethinking possibilities of, of, of next steps that we can take. And um, this LEAD program hinges on this innovative mechanism called a social contact referral. And, and here's the way that they work. Essentially, pretty much anyone in the community can initiate a social contact referral, and they very quickly and easily do so by contacting a local LEAD staff member. Usually, this is one of the program managers assigned to a particular neighborhood. The person initiating this referral provides basic information, a description, a location, maybe a name, about an individual in need who may be causing a public disturbance or causing some kind of concern. The program manager then passes this information along to a harm reduction case manager who's equipped with resources like supportive housing and healthcare and drug treatment like methadone and naloxone and other key services. And then the case manager goes out, locates the person, initiates intensive case management. They develop a, an individualized care program. They do continual check-ins with the individual over time, again, adhering to these harm reduction principles that see behavioral change um, as a long-term process. So when LEAD launches in a new neighborhood, one of the very first priorities is to begin institutionalizing social contact referrals as an alternative to calling the cops. And one of the groups that they very strategically target, it's not the only group, but one of the groups that they very strategically target is business owners um, and merchants associations and business improvement districts uh, called BIDS. Um, because as we've seen, as we've seen capital fly back into cities, as we've seen the back to the city movement, as we've seen central cities gentrify and redevelop, um, what we've seen is that these are the parties, business improvement districts, downtown redevelopment agencies, that are the parties that are really driving these 911 calls against vulnerable populations, right? They see folks with behavioral health issues or contending with behavioral health, health issues as disorderly, as nuisances, as, as things that are destroying this kind of purified public space that they need to clear out in order to continue the capital accumulation process. Um, some recent research by Chris Herring at UCLA has shown that in some cities we've seen 911 calls about these exact issues double, and 311 calls about behavioral health issues increase about 700% over the last five years. And as the other police scholars here know well, despite the prevalence of these calls, the police usually don't do a whole lot meaningfully except for a move along order or an arrest, which usually ends up leaving that person back out on the streets, uh, back in dire straits a few short days later, maybe a few short hours later, oftentimes worse off because of their police interaction and their interaction uh, with the criminal legal system. And so LEAD intervenes into this exact trend and it does these in, the, in these two ways. Um, so they engage in extensive outreach to local businesses in a kind of community organizing capacity. And they solicit businesses to compile a priority list of the local individuals that they've been, that have been calling the cops. Um, the, the individuals, who the businesses have been calling the cops on the most frequently, 
right? So you can imagine this is the guy who's sleeping in the doorway. This is the person running into traffic. This is the guy having episodes and, and, and shouting at customers. And they compile in, say, uh, a downtown area of a few blocks. They might compile the names and uh, descriptions of 20 or so people. Lead locates them, initiates social contact referrals, begins services. And it doesn't take long before businesses notice a major difference. And, and once Lead has demonstrated how much better it is at, one, addressing the concerns of businesses, and two, simultaneously addressing the behavioral health needs of vulnerable people, they start on the second phase of the pro program, which I think is actually the even more powerful one, is that they begin instituting and offering businesses a series of real-time alternatives to calling the police. In the most straightforward case, um, businesses uh, begin calling the project manager directly instead of calling 911. The project manager arrives on scene, often with the case manager in tow to begin outreach and intake on the spot. Some lead sites across the country have already received millions in city funding to institute citywide non-911 alternative dispatch systems, right? So again, this is an alternative to picking up the phone and calling a cop. And then lead is also uh, creating a web portal. So in these less acute situations where businesses can log in and initiate social contact uh, referrals. I'm, I'm happy to expand on some of this stuff in the Q&A, but I, I really wanna show this. And these were some of the numbers that really um, impressed me as I've been, been reviewing uh, the successes of LEAD so far, because it turns out that this, what I think is a rather straightforward intervention is, is really effective. And formal evaluations continue to demonstrate some really positive outcomes. So um, I'll share some here. Once an individual uh, has initiated, ha once they've had that social contact referral initiated and they start working with the case manager, they're 89% more likely to obtain permanent housing. They're 46% more likely to be formally employed or, or training for employment. They're 33% more likely to receive benefits like SSI and disability. They're 60% less likely to be arrested. They're 39% less likely to be charged with a felony. They spend 41 fewer days in jail per year, which equates to a yearly savings of roughly $6,000 uh, per person. I, I think from an economic analysis, from a political science analysis, it's, it's, it's really hard, I think, to argue with these numbers from a public health um, analysis. I think it's a real challenge to find any other program, local program out there that can match lead in these kinds of measures. But I don't want us to get distracted by the kind of formal evaluation measures of, of, of this program. I think what's even more important is that this program is accomplishing these numbers while reducing, fundamentally reducing the reach, the responsibility, and the potential damages of police involvement when it comes to behavioral health. And it's done this in a way that has forced local governments to free up funding for the exact kinds of social support services that LEAD is now providing as a replacement to handcuffs and jail cells. And so in this respect, I think that a program like LEAD couldn't be any more different than what are right now the current kind of in vogue popular reforms that we see recycled throughout city administrations, right? Again, things like officer mental health training or arrest diversion programs. I think even community policing, um, because if we ask what do all these things have in common, you know, particularly something like community policing, what does it do? It actually serves to increase the presence and authority of officers in our everyday lives. And I know that um, it's kind of fashionable, right, right now in this historical moment to outright reject anything that might even potentially be labeled as a reform, right, to reject policy, to reject ground level interventions. But I really think that perhaps we can push ourselves to be more thoughtful and more honest in differentiating between all of the things that might inaccurately be lumped under the same broad and nebulous umbrella term. And, and, and so the question is, how do we do that? And I think in order to do that, to differentiate the things that have been, I think, inaccurately lumped together, we need to find a rubric. We need to find a new evaluative criterion for distinguishing between what Andre Gores called reformist reforms, right? These are things that keep the status quo, tinker around the edges, as Alex called them, they're procedural. We need to distinguish between reformist reforms and transformative interventions, right? Transformative interventions are things through their concrete implementation. They facilitate structural transformation. They facilitate systems change. And we can very clearly locate the push to defund and abolish police in this latter category of transformative interventions. And so I'll just wrap up in saying that um, this work on LEAD has really convinced me 
that when it comes to policing, we can distinguish between reformist reforms and transformative interventions with a pretty easy test. We can simply hold these proposed efforts up in front of us and ask this simple question. Does this intervention, initiative, or policy meaningfully and permanently reduce the policeability of whatever concern we're fo focused on? Right? Does it shorten the arms of the police? Does it diminish police authority over a given social problem or need? If it doesn't, then we take it off the table. We replace it with one that does. And I'd like to think that we could go very methodically, one by one, applying this very simple litmus test to all the various social issues we're currently asking the police to respond to. Everything from homelessness to domestic violence to high school truancy, right? I think a good thought exercise is for everyone here to think about that particular social issue that concerns you, that the police are responding to, and ask yourself, what is the intervention what is the reform? What is the policy that would reduce policeability of that social problem? And I, I think it's a really, really helpful thought exercise in terms of pushing us forward, because I think if we engage repeatedly in that kind of a systematic evaluation, I think it's actually only a matter of time before we've come up with a series of interventions tailored to each particular social problem um, that, when implemented by their very existence, curtail police authority and jurisdiction to historically low levels, perhaps to non-existence. Unfortunately, I think absent this kind of clear evaluative criterion, absent this kind of systematic litmus test, I'm afraid that in a year from now, in five years from now, we could find ourselves, unfortunately, having the same conversation, wrestling with the same ineffective reformist reforms that we have today. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stewart. Um, so we do have time for questions and answers. Uh, we've got a lot on the table here. Let me just try to coordinate this a little bit. I think one way to do it is, um, since there are some questions that are directed at individuals, um, we'll just go through the order of the presenters and maybe hit some of those. So. Um, uh, Professor Phelps, there's a question about how defunding would increase the vulnerability of bona fide crime victims. And then a related question about, you mentioned progressive police chiefs and, and how is this, and what's the status of being a progressive police chief and, and what does that mean or is that just a ruse? Um, so if maybe you wanna address those and then we can go down and, and, and take the other questions directed at the other panelists and then come back all together hopefully. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Although I could speak for a long time on both those questions, I will um, try to be uh, concise. I, so, so on the question of like, how do we think about crime? I mean, I, I think sometimes the conversation about crime has gotten so hijacked by folks who use it as a sort of knee-jerk defensive invocation of the police that folks are hesitant to talk about crime. And I think one of the really promising things that's come out of the conversations that we're having in the, the last couple of months is about how many alternative responses there are to the problems of interpersonal harm and violence that are not the police, right? And that are not the, the carceral system. And so I think you know, the challenge is we have all of these sort of smaller scale experiments happening right now. We have these programs like in Northside, there's a couple of programs that are literally doing just incredible work on these shoestring budgets, right? It's like five folks hitting the streets trying to intervene in conflicts, for example, right? Or like one minister who has exceptional relationships with um, different groups of folks. So I, you know, I think part of the challenge is like, how do we scale up those interventions, right? And I think this transition moment as we try to shift from relying on the police to solve all the problems to relying on these dozens and dozens of alternatives, I think that's going to be potentially, and, and we try to scale up all those alternatives, that's potentially a really bumpy process, right, where the same communities that are most harmed by police violence are going to be harmed by the moments when those interventions aren't able to scale up and there's nothing left, right? And so I think one of the questions for me is like, why do communities impacted by police violence still call 911? Well, they call 911 in many cases because there's nobody else to call. And so I think the answer isn't, oh, well, we have crime and so therefore we need police. I think the answer is, why are these communities, right, the ones that we say it's okay to have these levels of crime and do nothing about, right, that persists generation after generation? So what are the sort of root causes approach? But also, like, how do we deal with that in the here and now? And how do we give residents real resources um, to address some of those problems? And I think, you know, Forrest's presentation on the LEAD model, I think, is one of the many kinds of experiments that I think he's absolutely right to say, like, 
we need to be looking at those and expanding those and making sure that they work right now. And I think the, the sort of criteria of like, does this improve outcomes for folks and does it reduce police power are exactly uh, the right ones. And I, you know, I was excited to see Forrest, I think you're the perfect person to study lead. And what I had seen of lead before was more, you know, the title is law enforcement assisted diversion. So I had seen a model of this, maybe it's an outdated one that was more law enforcement heavy and looked more like what you saw in your first book. And so I'd love to hear more later if I can use this as a platform to ask you a question about um, that, that and whether that shifted. And also that homelessness statistic or unhoused folks really shook me that like, where is that housing coming from? Because one of the problems in Minneapolis as I'm sure in other places is like, we're about to hit a mass homelessness crisis and we have um, encampments of unhoused folks popping up in city parks and the COVID pandemic has made everything much worse and there just isn't housing. Um, I mean, you can say there isn't housing, right? The city could requisition hotels today and make there be housing, right? But there isn't um, sort of the infrastructure already there. And so I'd love to hear more about sort of like how did they address that broader structural problem? Anyways, um, to wrap it up. So I think, you know, part of the question is like, how do we address these problems? And I think to tie it back to, to Wesley's point, you know, cities don't have as much capacity to address some of these structural problems as we often think that they do, right? A lot of this funding is tied to state funding and federal funding. And so if you have Republicans who are insistent on lean and mean at the state house and in the federal government, it's really hard to scale up the kinds of anti-poverty programs that you need. Um, and then, you know, I would just sort of signal to, to, to Foreman's work on locking up our own, right? Like the answer isn't that we need more police. The answer is that we need all of the above. We need alternative mechanisms of producing safety. We need alternative responses for folks and the smaller, ideally leaner police forces that are more focused and increasingly declining um, doing their job well. On the question of reformist chiefs, I mean, I think that ties into the last point I was just making. You know, I think we could sort of go in circles about like, whether it is possible to be a progressive police chief and what that means. I mean, I think there is absolutely an argument to be made that policing is inherently about maintaining class boundaries, about maintaining racial hierarchies. Um, and if that's your vision of police, then, then you can't, then the idea of a reformist police chief, right, is, is a, a non sequitur. I think there are models emerging, you know, Seth talked a little earlier today about the guardian model. I think for me, the question isn't so much progressive or not progressive for police chiefs. It's like, I wanna see police chiefs who really support solving social problems through things other than policing are really willing to oversee declines in their budget and their power in intervening in these kinds of problems. And police chiefs that are committed to not just making policing better and fairer, but also shrinking its footprint in tandem. And I think too often we judge progressive police chiefs on just the one without thinking about the other. So I'll pause there and, and see time to the other panelists and other questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, I mean, it's it, the, your comments do jump into, I think, the question that uh, Professor Skogan I'll ask you to address, um, which is, you know, about how to move forward given the power of states, right? The question here is that given them the power of states, given the majority of the states are conservative, how should police reform be approached? Are any of these local city initiatives, will they have any efficacy in reforming police at all? Um, how can we approach challenging police unions and their power over states without dwindling what little power unions have in the United States? So do you have any um, suggestions on this? And if you want to comment on any other issues brought up, please feel free to do so. Sure. Well, I think that uh, one, one, one thing to think about is the, what, what can be done in terms of um, bringing, bringing, bringing police officers and perhaps police unions into the conversation uh, and in involving them much more in discussing thinking, planning. Many of them, and I and this knows I've talked to lots of them, but turn out to be actually very thoughtful people uh, who've encountered lots of things and have lots of experience with the, with the world. Um, and in, in the end, many of these reforms simply require the hearts and minds of officers. We may try to impose that structurally, but the hearts and minds of officers are in, in the end the the ultimate goal, the ultimate, ultimate target of most of these ideas. Uh, so we need to find ways that can incorporate uh, officers, can perhaps even bypass unions. It, it can be surprisingly easy, especially uh, where the union itself has a reputation of being a uh, white police officers union. And the growing numbers of black and Hispanic officers can be convinced that there's, there's ways around them 
uh, toward toward reform. Um, there's even inklings of that in Chicago. Uh, so it's it's building a larger coalition. Um, you can work with Republicans in the state legislature. There's some things they will be for. Um, um, they they certainly they certainly are not 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 supportive of public sector labor unions. I say you really have to walk a very careful line here when it comes to uh, to, to 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 that to that issue. Um, even Alex Vitale has talked in his uh, in his in his, uh, in his presentations about the, the fact that this is not a union busting, can't be seen as a union busting anti-labor action. That's a very diff- difficult line. It's gotta, gotta be walked uh, in, in, in the kinds of places where reform is actually likely to happen. Uh, so I, I think being inclusive and being, and, and being more broadly, uh, in, uh, b- bring, trying to bring in diverse elements is, 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 is one. But another would be trying to change a bit of the, of the structure of the, of the whole discussion. Uh, so I think the idea that the Illinois Supreme Court recently, um, because of the pressing policy demand for um, uh, public access to police disciplinary records, uh, uh, over, overruled the statutes protecting them in, in order to their destruction, uh, uh, is an interesting thing. And uh, it, it, could, it, could, it could be that there's also a room for litigation here uh, in ways that would be more creative than in the past. Uh, but if it's if all this sounds like it's working at the edges, well, yeah, that's right. Uh, everything about American government uh, works at the edges. There's 18,000 police departments, uh, uh, and uh, we've just talked about seven of them today. Great, thank you, um, Forrest. You got some questions about the program, some details there. If you want to just go ahead, I'll give you the floor. Yeah, for sure. And and I think there's a way. These I've I've been scrolling through the Q and A, and I think these relate directly to. Uh, the stuff that Michelle brought up, which I think is spot on. Uh, Michelle, I'm sure I was I was imagining like your brow wrinkling when you heard me talking about lead in such in such kind of glowing terms. And I think rightly so. It's been a long journey for me. But but I want to like I want to I want to zoom out. Um, I and and I think this at least indirectly I think addresses some of the the, the comments and questions. Like I don't want anyone to walk away from this thinking that I am proposing that lead and this model alone it's like set it and forget it we just drop this into society like kumbaya police are gone everything's going right i mean i think to do that i i actually think that we have been like seduced into that kind of one solution fits all thinking precisely because we're living in a system right now where the police are the one solution fits all right that i actually think that um it, what we need to do is think about like, what is our theory of change, right? We have a theory of the ends that we want, but like, we don't have a theory of the means. I, mean, I don't want to say we don't. Many of us have the theory of the means, um, but I think we need a broader conversation about like, what's our theory of the change, right? Is a single program like LEAD a movement? No. Is, is a single organization a movement? No. Is a single legislation, no matter how historic a movement no what we need is a movement right as part of a, as part of a theory of change and a, a movement requires all these different actors operating at different different parts of the system right labor lobbyists insurgent politicians legal advocates practitioners why one because they target different aspects of a system and two because they actually hold el- other elements accountable right and so i think it's really inaccurate for me to actually present a vision of lead, a description of lead with all, without also mentioning all the civil society actors, including grassroots organizations and activists who are pushing lead to actually perform better, right? Um, and I think that this, I'm sorry for this premise, but I think this leads me into to, to, to speaking to what you brought up, Michelle, which is that when I first heard about this lead program in 2011, I was as skeptical as anybody on, on the planet could possibly be. At the time, LEAD, one of the reasons why I don't have the acronym in, LEAD stood for Law, a law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. That it was one more, at the time, one more pre-booking diversion program. But what I've, I've seen as we began d- digging into LEAD, looking at the way it's developed, um, that it was pushed really hard by a lot of key actors within the organization and outside of the organization who did not like the fact that officers were the gatekeepers for services, right? One incredibly vocal, incredibly influential set of actors were sex workers and sex worker organizations who were saying, look, the police are brutalizing us. If you want to link us with some kind of services, it can't go through officers. 
So we need to create a different kind of mechanism, which is what leads to the creation of social contact referrals. Now, social contact referrals were operating so well and were um, giving community organizations and activists the kinds of things that they were asking for that LEAD has now actually no longer, at least in Seattle, is no longer doing uh, officer arrest referrals. That is only social contact referrals. And in fact, LEAD has now changed its name. It no longer stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. I just got the most recent name. It's um, Let Everyone Advance with Dignity because we've got this great acronym and so now it's no longer Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion so we have to change it, right? And so as LEAD has been, um, there's, there's a, a thing in the Q&A, as LEAD has been pushed on the ground, it's changed its fundamental structure, which I think is what a movement does, right? A program that's involved in a movement in conversation with a movement is self-reflexive and changing the way in which it operates. And now that it's being scaled, now that it's being transferred to other sites, unfortunately, we're, seeing, we're still seeing kind of vestiges of the old lead because sites were set up previously. But in, in a, quite a few sites, officer arrest referrals are just not there, right? So it's, it's where we're, we, the, the program is transporting um, you know, this model that is, that is fundamentally premised on um, social contact referrals. So, so yeah, so I, so, so I think we really need to be thinking about our, our, our theory of change. And I think that this program is a really great example of how thinking about theories of change in terms of movement terms rather than single policy initiative, I think is the direction that we need to go in. Great, thank you. I mean, there's some other related questions here. Um, I guess, you know, this can go out to all of you, though, because there is uh, some questions here about, you know, we're talking about different interventions, but they all seem to be about nonviolent crime or non-gun crime. So do you, do any of you have any thoughts about, um, about dealing with that issue? Or is it maybe those kinds of issues are actually not as big, as important as we might think about? Um, Michelle, do you, do you is, is that the kind of issues that you think your community the community people you spoke to that they they want they want that kind of help in that domain or I don't know if any of you can can maybe want to say something about that um, Michelle you could start sure yeah no I think people are are very attuned to gun violence and the fear of gun violence you know it was really common we we started our interview guide by asking people to describe life in their neighborhood and how they experience the neighborhood and you know what a lot of people would say is is oh, you know, it's fine. I mean, I don't go out at night because I don't want to get shot and, and I hear gunshots every weekend. But, you know, as long as you avoid the murder gas station and this other place, then you're fine, you know, and just don't go out at night. So people had so normalized the, the heavy presence of guns and gun violence that it, it sometimes didn't even register exactly in the language of, of safety and unsafety as folks in communities that don't have that level of gun violence would register. And in Minneapolis, like in other cities, there has been uh, an increase in gun violence and homicides in recent weeks. And of course, there's a raging debate about how much of that is because of the city council statements around reimagining police and how much of that is, you know, I think the, the stronger argument is around sort of the dislocations of the pandemic and kind of the reopening up of the pandemic and the kind of increased distrust of law enforcement in the wake of what I would say the lynching of, of George Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department. So anyways, I mean, I think gun violence is incredibly salient to folks. And it's, it's one of those wedge issues that I think many people see as like, well, if you invoke gun violence, then like the answer is always the police. And I think what we know is that's not true, right? There are really effective violence interruption models that stop chains of retaliatory gun violence and that intervene before things um, become fatal shootings. I think what's tragic is we have so underfunded that work. And so like, so in Minneapolis, one of the frustrating things to me was that there was so much attention on this city charter amendment in recent weeks that won't go on the ballot to November and wouldn't take effect until the next year that people weren't talking about like, well, what about the budget now, especially in the context of the, the pandemic cuts? What are we doing in the budget now? And finally, we hit that, that conversation last week. And, and one of the council members who has championed this Office of Violence Prevention, which does exactly this, this violence interruption work, um, managed to get a, a million and a half dollars moved from MPD into the Office of Violence Prevention. 
Now people look at that and they're like, that's not what we said when we said defund the police, right? We didn't say like, take this chump change. But if you look at that as a percentage of OVP's budget, that's a near doubling of their budget, right? That is a massive increase in their scale. And so I think, you know, what we need to be looking for is not just what are good program models, but how do we massively scale them up so that they're not these fringe programs on the sides, but really are the main way that we're intervening, not just to respond to gun violence, but to prevent gun violence in the first place. Yeah, well, go ahead, Wesley. Um, to me, one of the most interesting features of the current debate has been the discussion of what it is that the police do and what is it that could be, that could be offloaded from, from, from their budget and from their personnel and done better, more effectively uh, in a non-police mode. So it's like lead. Um, let me, Michelle, now Michelle spoke to a concern. I'm, let me give you an illustration. Uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, we used to have we used to we used to have, we used to have uh, truant officers from Chicago who worked for the school system, who saw to it that kids who weren't showing up uh, went to school. They, they knocked on their doors and said, "Where's the kid?" Uh, but then the school system decided it was too expensive to have truant officers, and since after all it was against the law not to go to school, they said it's the police department's problem, and they stopped having truant officers. You can imagine how thrilled the police officers were to be given the job of figuring out who on they see in the streets should be is young enough to be required to be in school uh, and then taking them to school. This wasn't their idea of their, of their end. Would they be happy to give that back up to the school system? You betcha. Uh, so the, the, the police got these things in part because other parts, you know, other, other private and public and semi-private, non quasi-governmental bodies gave up on them. Uh, so Michelle's concern is that when the police department gives them back, uh, they aren't going to get the money because uh, a million and a half dollars is great, but it's, it's not much money. Uh, and so that uh, the, 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 the trick is to keep this from being a shell game where the money disappears uh, when it moves out of the police budget. It actually doesn't reappear uh, in the form of any, any meaningful services. Uh, and that seems to me is a real tough problem. Great, thank you. Forrest, did you want to jump in on here? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Mich Michelle said it perfectly, totally, totally took the words out of my mouth. So I, I, I don't want to repeat what she said. I, I do want to just kind of add an exclamation point around um, the kinds of alternative models that this kind of epidemiological approach to gun violence by community based organizations um, like that, that for me, like that's, that's the one I point to when we're thinking about like, what's the non-police response to gun violence, which, which, which I think very rightly said is that is that wedge issue, I do worry. I do worry that we're going to see the same kind of um, erosion of support that we tend to see in everything else that we offload to communities, right? I mean, I can't, as, as someone who, who studied a lot of homelessness uh, experiences in history, like I can't help but think about the deinstitutionalization yeah. movement, right? That pushed for the state to stop harming and being the first responder and cager of people who had mental health issues. And so the, the premise was, oh, we're gonna put them into communities. We're gonna in, empower and fund community organizations to take care of this treatment in the community. It's gonna be more humane. People are gonna be near loved ones. It's not gonna be carceral. The money never showed up, right? So, so I do really worry a lot. And I think that if we're talking again, like I'm keeping coming back to like, a movement is necessary with multiple prongs and multiple multiple tentacles that we need to not lose sight of like where that money is going. I think Wes, Wes, you, you, you put your finger on it exactly. Like if we're not careful about where that money is going, it's never going to make it to community organizations. Like show me a city government that is like increasing funding to, to community organizations over time. And then, I, and then I will say, I mean, I think that one thing that's, that I, I know it's on folks' minds, but I, but I, I just want to insert it into this conversation. You know, every, every, I often, you know, when thinking about community, uh, community alternatives to policing uh, and thinking about the epidemiological model and thinking about uh, offloading tasks from the police to other folks, of course, every single time in every conversation, gun violence comes up. Like, what do you do when people are being violent to one another? But I, I think the thing that we forget is how much violence police officers do every single day to communities. Right. I, I, I would wager, I mean, knowing, you know, young men moving through the streets of Chicago and how many times per day they are put against a wall or handcuffed to trees and made to sing and dance like the most humiliating, violent, brutal kind of treatment on a daily basis. I, I mean, I, I kind of think that like if 
police were even just like removed from the situation, the, the raw number of brutal incidents going on on American streets would actually decrease. So, I mean, I think anytime we're going to be a uh, hyper concerned and alarmist over like, well, the criminals are just going to start killing everybody if we take the police away. I mean, we conveniently are blind to the fact that like police are brutalizing people every single day on the streets. Um, and so I just, I just want to insert that, that like if we're talking about violence in society, to, to, to leave police out of like violence producers is, a, is I think a really short-sighted way to have this conversation. Great, thank if you. If I so. could just, can oh, I jump in yeah. one more time? <laughs> if I could just add a, an exclamation point to uh, Forrest's exclamation point. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly right, right? And that's part of where the conversation gets at like how limited, how we count and theorize these things are, right? That we don't think about that violence when we think about crime statistics, for example. But to circle back to the point about budgets, I mean, the, the mental health, the institutionalization, it has definitely been on my mind the last couple of weeks is like, what happens if we take away police funding, but don't actually put it anywhere? And I think one of the, and maybe the answer is like on that, it would still be better, right? Because police violence is so bad that it's outweighing that. And, but I think, you know, the thing that I think about and that worries me a little bit about some of the conversations that are evolving is, you know, if we think about like the Movement for Black Lives platform, right, they very explicitly frame it as an invest, divest. And I feel like there's been so much public conversation on the defund piece that the invest piece sometimes gets missed. And I worry a little bit that defunding the police sometimes gets sold in this sort of like austerity politics of like, we can save so much money, right? And I think, right, like police are actually a, a sort of cheap in a fiscal sense way to respond to these massive social problems that need massive wealth redistribution and power redistribution. And so I want sort of to shift the conversation sometimes to that invest piece, right? That it's not just about the divest piece. It's where do we put the money and making sure we saw with the like, you know, um, uh, um, oh, I'm blanking on the acronym, but the uh, policing, or not policing, prison reforms where we were reducing incarceration, we were supposed to move that money and we never did, right? And, and so I very much would like to push us to keep that in mind and to try and increase overall investment, um, moving it out of the criminal justice system and into um, community building funds. Thank you. Um, just a couple more minutes left. And, you know, again, there's too many questions to ask, but I think one, one thing that my mind's going to and um, some of the questions they're coming at is, um, the, again, the police side of this in terms of, you know, their responses to this, to this demands for change and particularly this demand to reduce police departments and also shift essentially shift the function away you know not asking them to do too much and and uh you know peter cunningham here asked would police trade less responsibility for smaller police departments and it, you know it seems to me that um maybe you all have something to say about this from what you know about uh police officers and police chiefs and police departments i mean it, it's, there's got to be a sense in which they don't want to do all the social work and they don't want to do all this stuff and you know, that, that in a sense, they could be open to this idea of, of reducing um, functionality and maybe reducing budgets. I don't know. But um, can you say anything about from your research um, on, on what you know of the police's own thinking on this and, and what you think maybe some avenue for change would be um, by thinking about police's own, own attitudes? Um, and I'll just let you go through the order you spoke on if you want to say something about this, and then we'll wrap it up. So that's me, I guess. Um, you want to, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I, I mean, I only really have the, the the case that I have most in mind and, and the chief that I spend the most time thinking about is uh, Chief Arredondo in Minneapolis. And I think he, you know, he is a black man who grew up in Minneapolis. He is from the community, he is of the community. He understands these issues at a really deep and empathetic level. He talks a really great game about how we need to, you know, reduce reliance on policing and invest in communities. But when it comes to actually reducing the force, you know, he proposed last year that we hire 400 more officers over several years, despite the like abolitionist groups already at that point gaining strength. And so I think, you know, police officers, have, they've convinced themselves that so much of what they do is necessary and so much of what they do is sort of required for social order that I think it's really hard for police chiefs to think about doing less, like doing less preventative patrol in particular, um, I, I think is really hard. And, you know, to be fair, I mean, I think I think that it's a reasonable expectation to say, if you're going to cut my force and tell me not to respond to these calls, you need to have somebody else responding to these calls. Um, but I think it's also fair to say you need to figure out how to use the money you have 
more responsibly uh, and to transition that to something that looks more like what the community is calling for. Yeah, Michelle's point about the who's going who's to do the 24 by 7 by 365 responses is, is a really important one. That's really expensive. It's a, it's a, it's a huge organization with transportation and communication. Uh, it's this is this 24 by 7 by 365 is not cheap, and that's another reason why police have got these uh, have, have, have been added, have been added these duties. Um, it's, it's you know this is really expensive. But the Skogan plan is to is to take the Chicago Police Department about 640 officers retire every year. Uh, so you negotiate some attrition as long as no existing officers and no existing officer salaries are touched, it would be much more amenable to discussion. Uh, and anyway, 640 positions is sort of more than the city can actually figure out how to use effectively in one year anyway. Uh, but that, that, gen, that, you know, that generates almost $90 million. Uh, and uh, they, could, uh, they, could, they, they could, in a couple of years of attrition, just a couple of years of attrition, establish some very significant responses. But it would take, it would take time, but it's going to take time anyway. Uh, and I think attrition is the, is, is the politically most savvy way to try to do it. Great, thank you. Forrest, uh, last words? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I, I mostly study low level crime stuff responses. I mean, fortunately, that's, I mean, only like 4% of police activity is spent on violence anyway. So at least I know that I'm, I'm talking about like the majority of police activity. And, and to make a little plug for um, the ethnography panel that preceded this one, like I think that this is where ethnographic research actually alongside police officers is really beneficial. Um, in doing that kind of work, one thing that I found, and, and I don't know if folks in the Q&A on the webinar want to challenge me on this, but I challenge you to find me an officer who really genuinely wants to be dealing with low-level crime, right? Whether it's folks on Skid Row who they're strapping on their latex gloves and dealing with that kind of stuff, or it's, you know, low-level noise complaints. I mean, that's that's, you know, talking about the warrior mentality, that's not what officers got into it for, right? There, there, you know, Steve Herbert has done some fantastic ethnographic work showing how officers even will like position their cars, turn them toward a more violent neighborhood, even while they're on other beats so that they can be the first car on the scene, right? Like this cultivation of kind of testosterone driven excitement around violence. Um, so I actually, I actually don't think it's hard on a broad scale to get officers and departments to stop focusing on low level stuff. Like I, I just, I, 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 I reject the premise that like officers are gonna want to be out there doing kind of disorder policing. Um, but then that does open up like this other issue that I don't necessarily have resolved myself, which I think we need to resolve as this moment goes on, which is okay, if we pull officers away from that low level disorder type stuff, which is the majority of things they respond to, do we then just send them to become even better violence workers than they are, right? Like we can get ourselves, I think, into a really dangerous situation where we relieve officers from the peacekeeping tactic that I think might actually be pacifying police departments and then turning them into the exact kind of stuff that we're seeing on the streets, which is like hardcore specialized violence workers, which then kind of zooming out makes me realize that like we can't go one or the other, right? We can't be like, reduce low, low level crime stuff and just focus on the really violent stuff. Um, because I don't think we want to see that police department. Um, I don't think we want to see them. I think that, that, that that's, that's even more dangerous in my mind than, than what we currently have now. So I don't know. I, I haven't worked it out. I think there are really smart people thinking about this. And I, I don't think any of us have necessarily worked it out perfectly or else we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I'm looking forward to, to, to working it out with the, with the rest of you all. Thank you so much. And um, we will have to draw it to a close. For those of you who did get your questions answered, I'm sorry. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to the panelists themselves directly. And thank you all for attending. And thank you to the panelists very much for all your insights. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll see you hopefully at the next panel.